What's up, everyone? Welcome to Unmasked, where things are discovered, uncovered, brought to the light, and made known. I'm your host, Lamar Barrett, coming live to you from PG County, Maryland. If you're interested in finding out about the untold stories of being a college coach, this is the show for you. Being a former assistant men's college basketball coach for 16 years, there are so many untold stories behind the scenes in the life of a college basketball coach. Now, let's unmask them. Today's guest is a longtime assistant coach, a terrific basketball IQ, a future head coach in this business. I know he's, he's been around a long time, and he's done a terrific job wherever he's been. And he's a native of Brandywine, Maryland, Chris Hawkins. Now, Chris is an outstanding player that played at Rafford, uh, at Rafford uh, in, in Virginia. All right, did an outstanding job there for four years, had a great career. And then he comes back home, and now he becomes the head coach at Blatonsburg in 1994. Uh, we had a terrific job for three years, and then he moved on, moved back to his alma mater for three years as an assistant with, with, with Coach Bradley. So he played for him, then he had a chance to work for him for three years before moving on to Buffalo uh, with Witherspoon for seven years as an assistant coach. And then going out to Tulane for one year with Dave Dixon, same Dave Dixon when I was an assistant coach at University of Maryland. Then he comes back home. He takes, uh, you know, takes a year and he works at Oxen Hill High School, same school I coached at for six years. And and then he wanted to get back into college ranks and he had a chance to go with a good friend of his, Mike Jones, who became the head coach at Rafford. And he spent five years with Mike Jones at Rafford. And then he's back with his old boss, uh, uh, Reggie Witherspoon at Canisius. Same amount of time, he spent seven years with him at Buffalo. Now he goes back up to Buffalo, and he's at Canisius College where he spent the last four years, and they're doing a great job of um, continuing to build their program where they've won a uh, regular season MAC championship, and they've been to uh, a couple of postseason plays now. I want to welcome to the show a good friend of mine, Chris Hawkins. Hey, Barry. How you doing, well, man? How you doing, Hawk? What's going on? Today? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing well, man. Doing well. You a jack of all trades, man. You you got you know how to get it done, man. Yeah, just trying to, man. Trying to get you guys out there as much as I can, man. So you know what? I, like I said, welcome to the show. Um, you know what? We're gonna jump right into it. Let's get unmasked. You know, Hawk. One of the first questions I like to ask, man, on the show, like, there's no handbook, man, to being a college coach, and you were fortunate to go back and work for uh, the guy you played for. Um, so tell me about that first day, the first week or the first month, like after things are done with human resources and orientation, like especially when no one gives you direction. Because you saw the plan side, but now you go to the coaching side. Tell me what that was like. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I tell you, one, one of the things that did help me there was um, is that I was a high school coach. So I was taking my I was taking my team to Rafford for team camps uh, every summer. Every summer I'd get my guys out of PG County. We'd take a trip right down to Rafford and we would we would play at their camp uh for two or three years. So I got a little bit of a feel for just coaching, um, you know, coaching high school basketball and also going back and, you know, being around Coach Bradley and I guess at the time Dave was there and Dick Benders was there. And then at the time, they was asking me if I wanted to be a coach and uh, at the collegiate level. So it was a little bit easy of a transition only because I was a high school coach. So I knew the coaching aspect of it was going to be a little bit uh, easier for me to, in regards to the transition. And then, of course, my uncle was a, was a coach, and that was one of the guys that I always spoke to um, in regards to coaching. Um, but it wasn't as bad of a transition only because, uh, you know, I was a coach already. And then Coach Bradley, I played for him. Uh, and by me playing for Coach Bradley, you know, I'll be honest, you know, I, I do see why a lot of these coaches at the higher level do bring in their own guys. Because when you bring in your own guys, those guys are going to be loyal to you. And I think loyalty in the business is very important. Um, so I was very loyal to him. He's very loyal to me. I, I learned a lot from him. He's a very, very, very good coach. And when I mean very good coach, he was not just the X and O coach. He was good off the court. He was good with the players. He had morals. He had values. You know, he did it the right way. He wasn't a social butterfly. And, you know, sometimes, Barrett, in this business, you, you sometimes pick up the, the characteristics of the head coach that you coach for. 
Um, so at the end of the day, I mean, I'm not a great social butterfly. You having me doing this right now is very uncomfortable for me. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's very important for young people to know how this business work. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, I think it was very easy transition for me because I, I played for coach Bradley, but working for him, he was able to help me make the adjustment to, to recruiting on the court. Uh, type of stuff. And I knew some of the system. So knowing his system was very, very good for me because I knew what he was trying to run. Uh, recruiting, you know, it was just basically getting out on the road and showing me the recruiting aspect of things, uh, being able to evaluate talent. Um, so those things he really helped me with. And then, of course, he had another such a coach there that I played for with Bill Lilly, which is, he's phenomenal, very good guy. But he also showed me how to do the scout reports and, and those type of things. You got to have people in the business going to help you do the stuff that is detailed, that is going to help you. Sometimes when you go and work for people that you don't know, you know, this competitive this competition where in regards to, hey, I ain't going to scratch your back because I don't know how far you're going to go with your business, how far you're going to go, how great it's going to be for you. So I had guys that really wasn't concerned about that. They was more so concerned about winning uh, and then obviously treating me the right way so I could be as, as good as I could be because if I'm good, then we all can be good. That's awesome answer, man. That's and that's good. Like having good people to work with is awesome. You talked about recruiting a little bit. Um, we all know that that's the lifeline of college athletics, man. Got to get good players, good people, if you want to be successful. And that's something you probably learned from, you know, day one. You know, being at Bradford and, and seeing what, um, you know, Coach Bradley did. And, but can you talk about like any time throughout your career, like? something that stands out from a recruiting story, like the best or worst recruiting story or, or, or something that relates to recruiting. Yeah. I think some of the, one of the, one of the best, I guess this is a really good recruiting story in regards to when I was at Rafford, I was recruiting a kid by the name of Prosper. Can I say names on this show, Gary? Yeah, you can say it. You can say it. You can, say, you can do what so, you want. If you fit. Sometimes okay. you might not want to say a name. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I don't mind saying this kid's name. He's a very good, was, you know, he played professional basketball. But I recruited a kid by the name of Prosper Karangwa. He was out of Montreal, played at Dawson College, played for Olga Rikak. And Olga Rikak was a woman, but she coached at the, you know, at the, at the, at the, at the, at the high school slash college. And the Canadian, they have that high school college type deal. So I went there and I recruited this kid, Prosper. I saw him at a tournament in Duquesne University. At the time, it was a fall. I guess a, it was some kind of um, Charlie Weber type of event in the fall. So I went there with Coach Bradley. Coach Bradley liked the Prosper. I started recruiting Prosper. And I thought we was making great headway. So it came down to basically us and Sienna. Now, if you, anybody knows the, the, the landscape of the East Coast, everybody knows that Sienna – in upstate New York is right on the border of Canada. So I went, uh, I was talking to the kid over the phone and, you know, phone conversation was going great. And um, I thought we was going to get the kid. And then uh, Coach Bradley, this was very, very unbelievable what he did. So he said, Chris, if you want Prosper, you're going to have to go up there. And, you know, of course, you know, being at Radford, you don't have a budget to be flying. <laughs> So I had to drive 12 hours. That was a 12-hour drive all the way up to Montreal, Canada. I went up there, spent time with, and now spent time with the kid. Now, mind you, the mom could not speak any English. She was straight French. She was a, she was a French-speaking lady. So I had to get a documentation uh, translated in, in English. So when I took my documentation up there, I just kind of, told her everything that we was offering and how we was going to offer it, but it was written in French so she could understand it. So then, you know, I do my little thing up there, visit with Olga, visit with Prosper, think we're in great shape, come back home. And now Prosper, after all the visits, it's getting, it's getting time to make a decision, sort of. So it was, I guess it was around, I would say there was probably around September, late September. And we was on a phone call with me and Coach Bradley. And Coach Bradley said to Prosper, he said, yeah, if, you, if, you, if, you, um, if you're not ready to make a decision, if you have a, so much indecision, you know, we're going to pull out. You know, we're, we're pulling out of this. We're pulling out of this deal. So I'm looking at Bradley like, hold on, man. You can't, we can't pull out of this. Right now, we in the, we, we, we're right there. We can get this done. So Bradley says, hey, we're pulling out. So he tells the kid we're pulling out. And, you know, me being young, I'm aggressive. I'm thinking we just got to hang in there. 
Well, lo and behold, two days later, I guess the kid must have felt he really, I guess Bradley must have knew something I didn't know. So we pull out. Two days later, the kid calls and commits. Okay, so he verbally commits to us. So I'm saying to myself, hey, go on, Bradley, good move. <laughs> so he makes the move to pull out, and the kid commits. And then now Bradley says, hey, now now, now the tough part comes, Chris. Now here we comes tough. Because now you got to work to keep the kid signed, keep him verbally committed. Now you got to get him to signing day, which is in November. Well, I'm working, I'm working, doing my very best. I drive up there one more time, come back. Now it's November 10th, 11th, you know, getting ready close to signing. You know, sometimes he answers the phone, sometimes he don't. Now Ogre Recac's calling more now, she's involved. So the day that he's supposed to sign, Ogre Recac calls and says, hey, coach. He's talking, yeah, she's talking to Coach Bradley. Hey, Coach Bradley, just want to let you know, Prosper has two NLIs here in front of him. And he's going to make a decision and sign with Sienna. And I'm like, whoa, hold on, how this happened? So that was one of the, one of the most unique, uh, you know, unbelievable recruiting pick, uh, concepts or things that I went through in regards to recruiting that didn't go my way. But, you know, it was very challenging. I learned a lot from that experience. I learned a lot about Coach Bradley and what he knows how to do, how things he, his experience in regards to getting things done. Um, but it was a very, very good learning experience for me. Um, that was one of the probably most unique situations, and I did not get the kid. That's the best and worst at, at the same time. So Absolutely. That's, that's, that's right. <laughs> I mean, right. you're right, though. He, hey, that's 100% right, though. When you sign, when a kid commits, the, the work doesn't stop. And a lot of people don't think that's the truth. But, man, you you, you sweat it out to sign a day because then everybody knows who you're battling against. So that's they correct. knew who to go after. So you're 100% right. That's great knowledge, man, especially for these young guys. They need to understand that. That's that's, that's a great story right there. Um, Hulk, you've been in it for a long time. You know, uh, wife, um, young daughter, graduated from college, so she's an adult now. But you've been a coach all your life. You know what I'm saying? So – what what did you have to give up or sacrifice achieving your current level of success? Oh, man, family time. Always family time. If there's a number one thing that you're going to always sacrifice, it's going to be family time. You know, uh, I tell you, Barry, that was one of the reasons why, you know, um, I was at a stage in my life when I was at Tulane. It had nothing to do with our relationship with me, me and Dave. I think people, you know, sometimes when, when in the business, you know, people try to figure out, put, you know, put things on, on situations that may not be true, may be false. Um, but it was no relationship problem with me and Dave. Dave was a great coach. Dave, Dave was a part of the Maryland family. He gave me an opportunity. But I think one of the things that happened to me was, is that I was not able to spend time with my family. I had just left Buffalo where I spent seven years and I was just able to spend more time. You know, I was here for seven years. I had established myself. Um, and I was able to spend more time with my, my daughter and my wife a little bit. Uh, and then, you know, I had to make a career change, only because a move, because not a career change, but I had to make a decision because there was a time where I got an offer from a GM Tech and I turned that job down. So I was at a stage in my life there where I was like, oh man, if I don't make a decision to make a move now, it may not never happen again for me being a head coach. So is that the right decision to make at the time? Probably not. But I was not able to spend much time. Once I went to Tulane, it was a different ball game, totally different level, um, more commitment, uh, just, you know, just way. And then, then on top of that, you know, my wife, my mom was, was, was ill. So I had to try to, I was figuring out how to get to my mom when I was in Buffalo, I could get a lot closer I could get to her. But being down in New Orleans, you know, way in the deep South, you know, and then working, the workload is way different, more demanding. You know, you get to the Conference USA level, it's, 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 it's you know, you got to get ready to roll. And so, um, you know, I had to spend more time away from my family. My mom was sick. Um, my wife had got a little illness down there at, at, um, in Tulane in uh, New Orleans. So I would say the number one thing is, is just family time. You, you really do get an opportunity where you cannot spend as much time with your family as you like to. And that can weigh on your mind a little bit. That that wore on me. That that really bothered me because you know coming from Brandywine, Maryland, I don't know, you know, I, you know, I, I was brought around a lot of guys. My family was strong, but I had good coaches. I had you know, you know, uh, Reverend Cage and, and and you know, and 
Mr. Matthews and, and, and Owen Johnson and, and, you know, on and on. You know, I had so many good coaches that, you know, and those people were all family people. You know, I was brought up in a family environment. And, you know, you get to college basketball, that, that family thing is, is, is not very important at all. So you got to figure out a way to get to a program and get to a person that believes in family. And if you don't, if you can't find that, it's going to be very, very, if you're a family person, and if you don't go with a person that does believe in family or does believe in spending time with your family, does believe in, you know, those type of things and, and having the same values as you, then it's going to be very, very difficult for you to make it if you don't, if that's what your desire to be, is to be a family person, coach, you know, those type of things. You're going to have to be able, we readily give that up uh, to be in the college, in, in college basketball. So true, Hall. That's so true, man. Now, we, we go into um, scout reports because you talked about that a little bit early. And that's what people don't understand. They can always tell, like, I mean, everybody's invested in scout reports, but when it's your scout report, you're a lot more invested. You can spend time. You don't watch seven to eight games. And, you know, you don't got calls. You don't got actions. And so do you always know who that guy is running, the, who's in charge of the scout on the sidelines, screaming and yelling, a little bit more vocal? A little bit more energetic, and so you know, then you got the, then you have the scout report that you might not do a great job. I'm gonna say it's not his best. You miss some calls. You got the actions, but the players, for some reason, they just don't. I don't know. They miss out on the scout report. And then there's always that one guy struggling shooting two for his last thirty from three, and now he wants to make three or four in the game. And and your head coach is looking at you like you told me you couldn't shoot. No, I didn't say that, coach. I said. He's struggling shoot. Talk about like one of your best or worst scouting reports you might have had over the years. Oh man, let me see. That's that's tough, Bear. You know, scouting reports, scouting, I'll be honest. This is where this is where I'll be honest that Bill Lilly, the Ron Bradley's of the world, really, really, really helped me because they were very, very detailed. As a matter of fact, I was more detailed at Rafford, my first job, than I've been in any other jobs I've been. Only because those guys would basically tell me, you know, Bradley was going to go as far as, okay, all right, we know the action, but once the action is finished, okay, show them the rotation. Now you got to go to the point where, okay, you yeah, come out the flare screen, they're looking for the flare screen shot. That flare screen shot's not there, he drives baseline. Okay, now where's your rotation coming from? Who's going who's gonna to fill over and, and, and take the charge? Who's going to sink? Who, where's the rotations? So in regards to that aspect of the scouting reports, you know, I, I had a good feel for how to do that. Now, you know, going with, you know, Dave Dixon and, and, and Mike Jones, Mike Jones was extremely detailed. And what Mike wanted was he was one of those guys that wanted to, uh, he wanted you to show every play. You know, you had to go, you had to do, it was four days of scouting. It was four days of preparation. When you had to, when you had to, when you have to do a Mike Jones scout, you're, you're doing three to four days, which at the end of the day, you're going to go in there, you're going to feel very comfortable, but you're going to work your butt off three or four days prior to that. So I would say one of the, one of the, one, one of the disastrous was, is down in uh, Presbyterian. We played Presbyterian. I was, I guess, in my, I had just got back into business and I was at Radford and I had the Presbyterian scout. And I mean, they had a big kid that was really, really good. Can't remember his name. They had a guard that was really good. And I didn't know this, but the coach at Presbyterian, he was a legendary coach. I mean, he knew his X's and O's, and he knew how to get those guys shots within the offense. And I had never seen that offense before. So I had never seen it. So I was like, oh, man. So went down there, killed my scout report, and my God, we got blown out by 30. Got blown up by 30. And then, of course, you know, you're you dealing with some guys that – you were dealing with some guys that I didn't know these guys. You know, I didn't know J.D. that well. I didn't know Kyle Getter that well. It was my first real job. Now, Mike knew J.D. from Mike Rose and and Kyle Getter worked with him at VCU. So, you know, now I'm, I'm trying to fit in and do get, get, get going and do the right thing and, you know, show that I know what I'm doing. And, God, man, that was a, that was a bomber. I mean, I bombed that. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I, they felt like, oh, my God, Hawk, can't, Hawk may not be able to get this done. So that was one of, the, one of my failures. I thought that I didn't do a really great job. Um, and then there was jobs where I had the Gardner Webb scout, and they just did. They just was like, 
they they ran a spread offense. They did ball screen pop. They had these four men that could pop. They had five men that could pop, and you really had to figure out how to, you know, how to beat them. And I think that Gardner Webb, they had a talent. Same with VC, uh, VMI. VMI had the same thing. So they they was another spread offense trying to score a lot of points. Had those guards was really good. Four men that could pop. So. Those those guys that I think I did a really really good job on only because I, I figured out how to get it stopped. Um, you know, Mike Jones was not one of. The, sometimes you get with coaches Barry, that they no matter what the other team does, this is how we're covering it. If we're gonna hedge ball screens, we're hedging ball screens. If we're switching ball screens, we're switching ball screens. You know, if we're gonna uh, chase uh, pin downs, we're chasing pin downs. Mike Jones was not into that. He was into, you are the scout guy. You're the one that's in charge of the scout. You give me the game plan on how we're going to get this team stopped. I don't care what it is. You better get it stopped. So is that good? Yes. But at the end of the day, you got to be on top of your game. You got to be really detailed. And that's what you're talking about in regards to you're going to, if you're in that kind of a role where you got to come up with the game plan, you're definitely going to have to watch five, six, seven different games so you're prepared for anything that they may do that's different. You know, when you got a coach that doesn't that doesn't believe in that, where he's gonna just do something a certain way, well, you may not have to watch as much, um, because no matter what they do, you're gonna cover it that way. So uh, those are the two or three situations where I think I did a great job, but also did you know fairly not 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 so of a good job. Awesome answer, man. What's the um, what you think? What's the biggest challenge you think you've experienced since you've been been in college coaching? Oh, man, challenge. I, I guess recruiting is a challenge. Yeah. You know, recruiting is a challenge. And I say this because um, every coach that you work for has a different philosophy in regards to recruiting. You know, uh, Reggie Witherspoon, he just said, hey, Chris, you're my guy. You Go get me players. You know, you recruit the nation. Go recruit the whole nation and bring me, bring your list back and those guys and make it happen for me. You know, Ron Bradley, he wanted me to recruit a certain area, DMV. You know, don't 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 deviate from the DMV, Chris. That's where I want you at. That that's a small pool. That's a very small pool. It can handcuff you, especially if you're not connected in that certain area. I was connected to the DMV, but he pigeonholed me into a certain area in a certain region. And when you do that, then you gotta be really good in that region. Because if not, now you you can be short with regards to getting a player. Um, you know, so Re Reggie was national, you know, Bradley was more regional. Mike Jones was more, more regional, but expanded because we was at Raph at that time. This one, the last time he wanted me to do more in North Carolina when he could do a little DC with me. So we did DC and Maryland together. He wanted me to also go to Georgia. So, uh, you know, different coaches, different styles and recruiting. I, I would think that's the biggest hurdle in, in regards to being able to uh, make the adjustments to recruiting. Mike Jones, you got to get Mike Jones's player. You, you know, you, you got to get what he wants. If he likes Devin Cooper, you better freaking recruit Devin Cooper. If you think somebody is better than Devin Cooper, but he likes Devin Cooper, all best off on what you like, Chris. You got to get the kid that the coach wants. So everybody's different. Uh, Dave Dickerson, he was another guy that, you know, he had, um, he wanted me to do regional. You know, he's another regional guy. Um, but, you know, Dave, at the, at the time when I was down there with him, you know, he was more so depending on me to, to get the guys, evaluate the guys, and tell him who I liked. And – but I don't think he had full confidence in me being able to evaluate Conference USA. If I could say one thing. I Because I, I've never been at that level, but he, I don't think he had confidence in, in my level to recruit that level. Um, and here's why I say that because there's a kid by the name of Ivan Asker that I was recruiting and he ended up going to uh, had a great career, ended up going to Murray State had a great career at Murray State well Ivan Asker, we was the only one recruiting Ivan Asker only, recru only one, only school recruiting he was out of Florida and I was, it was in the summertime actually it was a spring it was a springtime when I saw him and I was like yes, he's the guy so I had built a great relationship with this kid and then, boom, Dave went to see him in the spring. Early in July, he saw him. And then early in July, he didn't like him. So then later on, in the later on parts of, the, of July, boom, Ivan blows up. 
And so once Dave tells me that he didn't like the kid, guess what I do? This is you can't do, you back yeah, you back off. You go to you try to get the next guy in front of him. Well now Dave is like, hey, shit, Chris, let's go, baby. Let's get Ivan. Let's get it done. So now I'm I was like, oh God, I gotta I gotta get, get back in this mix a little bit. So by the time I try to get back in that mix, you know, Ivan had kind of just said, you know, man, y'all had me in it early. He said, I wanted you guys and it kind of just went went south. But, you know, you got to be able to, to recruit the way the coach wants you to recruit. That is a hurdle, and especially if you – especially when you feel like you can evaluate and you've been given an opportunity to evaluate. Like Reggie – Reggie's my style. Reggie going to let me just get it done. Go do your thing, Chris, and bring him to me, and then I will tell you whether he's good enough. And then once you get him good enough, boom, you know, you can bring him. I think another thing in regards to recruiting Lamar that's very important is, is that for young people, is young guys, is that you have so many guys on staff that's trying to prove themselves. So, you know, and, and they're not, they may not always give you an authentic evaluation. Now, when you're working with guys that you know, okay, then everybody, no one has an agenda. When you got guys that you don't know, now all of a sudden there could be some stuff going on behind closed doors that you don't know that's causing your player not to be pushed to the forefront and he could be better. So being able to, you know, support your player and get the player that the head coach wants, but also being able to have a, 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 an understanding of the dynamics of having more than just yourself to, that's going to do the recruiting and an understanding that you got to give your authentic belief on who's better, and who's not, and take your personal wants and, out of it and getting the best for the for the coach and for the program. Terrific, man. That, and I and I like what you said. You know, talking about and, and you're right because coaches change their mind all the time. Like Dave didn't like him, and so like sometimes you're like, you know what? I'm gonna just keep recruiting the kid because I know he's gonna come back and end up liking. Him. And like and, and and that happens. I mean, so yeah. young people who don't understand that when when the coach say I don't like him. Try to keep them warm just in case because they would change their mind in a minute. Head coaches definitely would do that. Um, <laughs> so, now, Hawk, I always said, you know, I've always watched you from afar. And so I was coaching high school when you were, you know, you were at Rafford and uh, even when you went to Buffalo, I was still coaching. So, um, and, I, and I always said, I think he's going to be a head coach someday. I just think you, you have it. Um, do you ever find that there are things about you that people misunderstand? Like what? Because you you're about your business. You come in, you don't say a lot. You come in and your business. Well, like, do you think guys look at you and you know they things that they might misunderstand about you? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding with me. I I do know that um, I think that people think I'm a, a, abrasive. I think they think that I'm um, aggressive. Um, I'm not I'm not friendly. Um, you know. Maybe too serious, you know. I, I think that's some of the stuff that comes off. I just think that at the end of the day, again, going back to, going back to my very first job, Barry, which is very important, and, and this is something that maybe I, I, young guys got to be who they are. But I work for Coach Bradley. Coach Bradley was always into Chris. The one thing about college basketball, you have to do your job. It's very important you to figure out how you can best do your job. That was something reiterated by him over and over. Some guys are going to be able to go out and hang out, stay out till 2 in the morning, you know, and then get up at 8 o'clock and do a great job. If you're not one of those guys that can do that, then that's not going to be the way you're going to be effective, then you shouldn't do that. So you got to find your niche and how you're going to approach this college basketball game. He said, my niche was I wasn't a social butterfly. I did my job. I learned the job. I, you know, I recruited. But after it was over, I was going to the hotel and get my rest for the next day. So I learned how to, and I was in it for three years, and that's how we operated. And so at the end of the day, Barry, that was something I never changed. I, I, I was always one of those guys that I'm coming in the gym, I'm doing my job. It's not going to be a whole lot of laughing, not a whole lot of giggling. I'm not going to do a whole lot of talking. And some people might think I'm standoffish by doing that, but that's just the way I was taught. That's just the way I was brought up in the business on how it, how to do it and how to do it right. Um, is it right? No, but that's just the way I, I did it. Now, when you say I may be a head coach, I, I don't know about that because being that way, 
is not going to help you become a head coach. And you as a person have got to be okay with that. If I never become a head coach because of the way my personality is and how I approached it, then I'm okay with that. Uh, but I do feel good about how I approach it, how I worked, uh, the relationship that I do have with certain people. Um, but, you know, if there was something that I, I could think that people would say is that I'm not, I'm a, uh, I'm non-sociable and, you know, he's too serious. And, um, you know, and at the end of the day, I, I apologize for that. It was just, this is the way I was, that's the way I was trained, <laughs> the way I was brought up. I don't think you owe anybody an apology. I think you've done a terrific job for your career. Um, you, we're in this business. You're an educator first. You're a teacher first. You, you had good coaches. You talked about it when you was at Gwen Park. Or, you know, then even in college, we're like, what do you try to teach your players besides basketball? Oh, man, that's a lot. Of, that's a lot, Barry. You know, some of it is, you know, more so – you know, just just understanding the, the the magnitude of relationships, and, and when I say relationships, because that's something that you know, that's something that's important for young people is is at the university itself. They got to be able to build a relationship with the trainer, with the assistant coaches, uh, with the professors, you know, with the deans, with the vice president. Uh, you know, with the athletic director, they got to be able to build relationships with others. I think that's one of the things that, that kids fall short is they trying to sometimes stay in their own little circle. And at the end of the day, when it's, when it's time to get a job, when it's time to, you know, get a resume uh, put together or someone to, to stamp you on what kind of person you are, sometimes these people don't really know who you are to give you the push that you need to be able to, to get a job. So I think one of the things I try to tell those guys is relationships. Very important to build relationships with more than just your coaches. You have your, you have your teammate, you have your coaches, but you got to sometimes go outside of that, that realm of people that, you, that makes you comfortable so that when you come back 15 years from now or five years from now or to, you know, bring your family or to, you know, either come back to, to visit or, or to try to get a job. You got some other people other than your coaching staff that can say, oh, yeah, he's a great kid, great guy. You need to hire him. So I think that's one of the things, relationships. And then I know one, one of the other things is that we got a lot of guys that play, play professional basketball. And one of the things that bothers me the most is that guys go over there and get this tax-free money, and then they come back and they don't invest their money. Uh, that, that is something that I try to help them with. I tell them about the things they need to do. I put them in contact with certain people that, that I know that can help them get started with putting just a little bit of money away. Those are the things I would say, relationship, and then investing their money and, 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 and saving their money because they're coming out of this college with no debt. And now they go over and they got all this money coming in. Instead of buying new cars and all that, invest your money so you can get ready to be in the work field and have being able to get your home or have you get started five, six, seven, eight years, however long it takes you to, you know, when you finish playing to be able to get out and, and get something going for yourself. That's, that's, that's a great two pieces of great advice right there. Um, what are your best and worst memories um, in coaching? Uh, my best memory was going back to Radford with Coach Bradley um, and winning, that, winning, winning the championship on, on a buzzer beater. That was absolutely the best experience ever. Experience ever. I have two worst memories. One is we turn the program around at University of Buffalo. We go all the way to the championship game. You know, we, we score with eight seconds left in uh, eight seconds left in the game. I'm sitting there beside Mike Minica. I said, Mike, we scored too soon. Mike says, no, nah, Hawk, we're going to be all right. They go right down, shoot a shot. Jeremy Fair shoot a shot. He misses it. Boom, Leon Williams tips it in. They win the championship. And then the second, I guess, the worst was my decision to leave Tulane. I think that was, that was one of the probably the, actually – Tulane, and then probably not taking a job at, at Virginia Tech, but not taking a job at Virginia Tech, I did the right thing by the players that I recruited. So it wasn't as bad. Um, but leaving, leaving, uh, leaving Tulane in college basketball like that, being young and, not, and understanding the business, people are going to look at you in a different, different way. Um, so I think people look at me in a different way because of, of me leaving uh, that situation. And then evaluate me and Dave and, you know, looking at us as, in regards to having an issue. Um, I think that that probably was stymied my 
my career uh, more than anything is the Dave Dickerson situation at Tulane. And then, of course, you know, me not taking the jump to Virginia Tech. Because if you're not going to get one of those jobs at the higher level, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to be able to get a head coaching job. Um, that, so is, those, that, that is so true. That That is so true. I, somewhat, actually, Chris Walker made that. I was at Old Dominion. He was like, you plan on getting a head job. You're not going to get one from – he was like, you got to move up. This is just yeah. how it is, the business. And, I mean, I, I remember him telling me that six years ago, six, seven years ago, like, and, and, and he's 100% right in what you just said. And Turner Battle also had that same answer with the tip in at the buzzer. He talked about that yeah. is one of his worst memories. He definitely – he talked about that um, as well. Um, and I'm I, you know, I said – I did, I, did I did say about the Dave Dickerson thing. One thing I didn't mention is that – so Dave is a part of the Maryland family. See, so Ron Bradley, Oliver Purnell, so Oliver Purnell recruited me, you know, Oliver Purnell left, you know, Brown Bradley get the job. So that's all the Maryland family. You know, Dick Bennett was down at Tulane at the time. Dick Bennett was part of us. You know, he worked for Ron Bradley. So we had a family going. So then I went back to Tulane with Dave and, and Dick, and I'm that's my family. And so and what I'm saying to you is that it was a mistake because I was back with my family. And in regards to staying strong in this business and staying connected in your business, sometimes you got to stay with the family. If you go outside the family, now you, you, you put yourself in being vulnerable to not being able to get the support and, and, and that you might need in regards to getting to the next job. And that's something I know that certainly has hindered me. But, you know, it's a decision that I made, but I think the young people need to understand. If you're with people that is a part of your family, and if you decide to go outside of your family to make this thing work, you certainly better be ready for the consequences. <laughs> so so true, man. So true. Um, What's the strangest thing a player has done outside of the basketball court? Wow. Strangest thing a player has done outside of the basketball court. Uh, oh, this, uh, may be the part, this may be the part that you might not give a name, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> strangest, strangest thing a kid has ever done. Strange. You know, it's, it's – Oh, okay. You know? I got a, yeah, I got a strange thing. So, I got one of, one of the kids um, – this is very strange. I, I have no idea why he did this. You know I mean, so a kid was supposed to be moved out of the dorms in the summer. So we told the kid, hey, listen, you got to be out of the dorms by, you know, July the 5th. You got to be out. You got to be out of there. Stuff's got to be moved out. You got to be gone. So <laughs> he knew this. And so then next thing you know, July the, uh, July the 7th, he's not out. So now all of a sudden we get a phone call. From, from from public safety on July 7th saying, hey, listen, we have somebody that just broke into this this dorm room and broke into the dorm room. The door, the window screen is uh, is out and and, and 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 everything. So come to find out, the kid knew that he was supposed to be out July 5th, had his stuff in there for two days afterwards, got nervous and, and didn't want to tell us about it. So he breaks into his own room to get his stuff out. Instead of just telling us, and so we can go get, you know, public safety to say, okay, listen, the kid's a little late. He's two days late. Can we get in here and help him get his stuff out? He goes and breaks into the window, breaks in, and try to get his own stuff. Unbelievable. So. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's unbelievable. That is unbelievable. Um, Paul, like, you've worked for some good guys. You've seen some, you know, institutions. Um like, if you had a chance, I'm just saying, if you had a chance to get your own program, like, what expectations would you, ex what expectations would you have from administration from the top to the bottom? What What would be your expectations? I mean, you've seen a lot, so what would you, what would your expectations be? Um, just, to, just but my expectation for the administration is just to, just to know the landscape of college basketball in in general. Just know what, like, if, you, if you're going to give me a budget of, of $100,000, then you got to understand what $100,000 is going to get get us. Okay, now, if you're going to give me a budget that is, you know, more than what the other league is, the other teams in the league is getting, then I got to understand. But I would just want them to understand the, the landscape of college basketball and how it actually works in regards to having to be successful. You know, there is no magic wand. The more money you have, 
the more success you can have, the better coaches you can get, the better players you can get. Um, you know, so I just want them to understand, don't, don't expect the unexpected. Don't, you know, don't, uh, don't expect me to do something that's magical in regards to uh, winning if you're not giving me all the resources to, to win. Uh, so just make sure you understand the aspects of giving giving me the you know the proper tools and resources that you would give anybody else. You know, don't you know if I if I come there if a, if a coach before me was getting you know two hundred thousand dollars to uh, uh, recruiting budget or a budget, and then you give me the job and you only give me one hundred twenty five thousand dollars to do the same that you gave him. Well, you asked me to do something that's just you know a little bit. You you ask for more. You know, you, you want more for less. And I just don't think that that is something that um, would be fair. So just understanding the, the, the landscape of college basketball and, and giving me the proper resources to, to allow me to be successful um, in regards to developing my players, uh, getting the best players, getting the best coaches, uh, being able to get the, obviously the top level equipment to help those guys train. Uh, and just basic stuff like that, I guess, tomorrow. Just knowing the expectations and, uh, of the university themselves and then just knowing the landscape of college basketball and, and giving, giving me a fair chance to, you know, be able to get the top level, whichever that is, coaching and, and players. It's a great answer, man, great answer. Um, you talked about a little bit before winning and being with Coach Bradley and all, and going back to Rafa, but, like, what's – the biggest accomplishment you have experienced since you've been a college coach. What's been your biggest accomplishment? <sighs> um, shoot, are you talking about basketball? I mean, either one. Like, I know some people talk about seeing kids graduate. They didn't expect to. I mean, so, but what's your biggest accomplishment? What's the biggest accomplishment you've experienced? Oh, I'll be honest with you. Being the biggest accomplishment for me is being able to coach college basketball for 20 years. Being able to be in college basketball for 20 years, and 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 being and being able to do the job the way I feel like I should do it. I, I don't think I've, I don't think I've, um, I think I stuck with my family values, morals, um, beliefs. I haven't changed who I am. Uh, if I go home to see my uncle right now, he would, he's going to know who I am. You know, I, I'm not a different person. I didn't let the business change me. Uh, I think that one of the biggest accomplishments is me being who I am and enjoying doing the business the way I think it should be done for me and for the players and for the coach that I work for. Um, there's many times that, that I think that, you know, in this business, the business will change you as a person and who you are. Uh, the person you work for can change you and who you are and your values. So there are going to be some things you're going to give up. But in regards to who you are as a person, that's something you got to hold firm to. And I, I, I do think that's an accomplishment that I am Chris Hawkins today. I was Chris Hawkins uh, 20 years ago. Uh, if you talk to me, you know, back when I first got in and you talk to me now, I'm the same person, maybe a little bit more mature, a little bit more wiser, but I am the same person. That is true. I, I totally agree with you. And I'm, I'm assuming you talk about your uncle Earl Hawkins and I got to shoot, uh, you know, he, he retired this year. I think he announced mm -hmm. his retirement. So yeah. outstanding career to him, you know, running, especially I probably got to know, know him more, not as the coach when he was coaching, but more with him running uh, Prince George's County Athletics. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I got to say shout out to uncle Earl, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, this might throw you for a loop a little bit because this you gotta you'd be like, come on, man, where did that come from? But what movie or TV show title best describes your week? Movie or TV show title? That is that the best describe what? Your week. Uh, my week. Okay, what I do in a week? Yeah, like if you working, if you working, you know, some people try to get an answer now. It's easy because uh the pandemic going on, but like, you know, so how, how is it like it work week? Cause I know it's, you know, some people say fast and period. Some people, they come up with some answers they or they come yeah. up with their best show. What would you think? Mm, that's a good one. Uh, a TV show that, that, that describes me. Hmm. 
That's a great one. I I I can't I can't I can't come up with one, Barry. Um, I'm, I'm gonna let you think about it. We could come back to that. We could come back to that. What's the one? Hold on, I got one for you. I got one for you. What's the one where, they, where the um where's the one where they do the auctions? It's a the uh, auction thing where everybody you know you go you you there's auctions and they competing against each other for auctions and it's going fast and I can't know remember the <laughs> I know. I mean, I know what you're talking about. Garage, garage auction or something. It's called it some kind of garage auction. <laughs> See, that's what that'll it be, is. <laughs> that would be mine right there, because I'm I'm competitive. <laughs> I'm very competitive. I'm competing at everything. I'm competing on on the court. I'm competing off the court. I'm trying. I'm I'm competing. You know, I'm always trying to beat somebody. <laughs> I like that. I like that. A little different. Like it. Yeah. Like now. Storage wars. The- called storage wars. Storage wars. Storage wars. Okay. Okay. Storage Wars. What's your favorite word or phrase? Because, Hog, I'm sure you got a few. And I know you do because Turn of Battle talked about it. But what, what's your favorite word or phrase? It's some shit out here. <laughs> yeah, say it, it again because I, I, I want the people to hear that one again. What was it? <laughs> it's some shit out here. I like that. I like that. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um... What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Oh, wow. All right, this, this is going to be wild to you. Uh, maybe not. Owen Johnson. I was a high school coach at Bladenburg High School. And I was one year into my master's program. And my, I had one more year to do. And I was offered a job to go to Radford with Coach Bradley to coach that, 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 that year. And I went to meet with Owen Johnson. He said, you absolutely cannot do that. You cannot go to Rafford when you got one year left in your, in your master's degree. You're going to need that down the road. So he said, you need to tell him you're not going to be able to do that. And I was like, oh, my God. You know, at the time, I, you know, I got mentors. That's what, in, in Maryland, my dad wasn't around. So, you know, I got all these mentors. Owen Johnson, Reverend Cage, Mr. Matthews. So all these people, my uncle. So those are the people I'm talking to. So... I tell Owen about it. He said, oh, oh, no. Oh, no, absolutely not. You're not doing that. So he tells me, you can't take that job. You need to call him and tell him you can do it next year. Now, me not knowing the business the way I, you know, anytime you, you tell somebody you don't want the job, you ain't getting it next year. So, um, but, you know, I told him I couldn't do it. I got one more year left in my master's program to do and can't do it. And, you know, fortunately for me, he didn't hire nobody for that next that for that, that position. And so the next year it came. I had my master's degree, boom, went on and got on wow. staff there. So that that's and, and and Mr. Johnson's right, because guess what? Ten years later, guess what? I got out of the business. And yeah. guess what I had to rely on? I had to rely on my master's degree to get back into teaching. And he was able to help me get in because of that. Uh, that's shout out Mr. Johnson. That's another. PG County vet right there, man. That's another yeah. one, man. All those guys are great guys, man. Um, Hulk, what, what does success mean to you? Success is um, being able to – I'm just talking about success as a assistant coach. I, I, this is what I feel as assistant coach in college basketball is success is this. It's being a strong liaison a strong liaison to the players to be successful within the environment that they're in, whether it's off the court, on the court, being a liaison to them. And then also being a strong liaison for the head coach. When I say a strong liaison for the head coach, that means being able to get those kids to do what they're supposed to do and how to do it and do what he wants them to do. But also being a a, a strong liaison and giving him what he needs as an assistant coach to be successful in regards to scout reports, uh, getting the right recruit, um, you know, preparing for travel, you know, th- that is the, that is the, I think is being successful as an assistant coach is being able to say, okay, I can sit back and do and feel good about my job because I'm a liaison for my players. And if I'm a good liaison for the players now, Barry, they're going to graduate. Um, they're going to enjoy their college experience. Uh, they're going to eventually we should win. Uh, and then, they ultimately should be able to get themselves in a position where they can get a professional contract if they're good enough. And that, that's, that being a liaison and doing it the right way, those things will happen. That's, that's, that's going to transpire for them. And then the same thing for the head coach is being able to feel good about 
him feeling good about me. When, I, when he goes off recruiting and I'm on a campus by myself, he's got to know he's got an ally. He's got an ally that's going to do exactly what's supposed to be done, whether it's with the players, whether it's with the athletic director, whether it's with strength and conditioning, whatever it is, he's going to feel good about being able to leave and knowing that Chris Hawkins is going to be able to keep things moving in the right direction. So I, I would say success is being a great liaison for whatever, for wherever you are at the time, for the players and for the coach. And that's going to, that's going to, I think personally breed success for everybody. And of course, for you as a person, you should be able to survive in this business because a lot of people can, should be successful if you do it that way. Hey, Hawk, man, you've never been a self-promoter. Um, you know, you, your, your work speaks for itself. Um, but if you had to choose three adjectives to describe yourself, which would you choose? Uh, loyal. Loyal, passionate, hardworking. I love it. I love it. Um, now, what, because this is different. Right? So everybody's answers are usually different. Like, what qualities do you value in the people with whom you spend time? Say that question again. What qualities do you value in the people with whom you spend time? Oh, the value. Okay. Um, I spend my time with. Uh, I tell you, I, you know, I spend a lot of I spend a lot of time with with Reggie Witherspoon, man. Uh, I, I'm mean, I'm be honest. I just think the man is just so authentic. I mean, I just just being, you know, just 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 very authentic. He just a, he just a real straightforward. You know, he's not a, he's not a, he's not no guy that's gonna you know be you. You know, he's very authentic. Yeah, that's the quality of Reggie Witherspoon. I like he's authentic. He's very, very genuine. Oh, I love it. Authentic. Someone similar to you, that's how you are. Um, what person or persons, in your cases, I heard you say it plenty of times, what persons and or event has had the most influence on your life? Well, uh, that's going to be tough. Uh, the one that had the most influence, I haven't mentioned at all. Maybe I've mentioned in, in passing, but the one who had the most influence on me and only because, you know, I wouldn't be who I am is, is Oliver Purnell. I mean, Purnell was the one person that not need to get me in college coaching, but he gave me a scholarship to draft. You know, I was, a, I was a prop 48. You know, I don't know if anybody know what a prop 48 is, but back in the day, I mean, I had to set out my first year. So he took a chance on me. You know, he took a chance on Chris Hawkins. So if I don't know anybody, you know, you know, anything in regards to helping my life, <laughs> it's got to be Oliver Purnell. You know, because he gave me a chance to be a rapper, and then the rest is history. You know, the next one will be Ron Brad, you know, because he gave me my first college job. You know, so, you know, and then and then from there, you know, I guess you got to go to Reggie. Cause Reggie's been able to – he's been – I've been working with him for 11 years, and we have a personal relationship and so forth and so on. So those are the three people in college basketball that I would say is the ones that I would say. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, awesome, awesome answer right there. Those are three great guys, man. And I like to end with this, Hawk. I always ask this question at the end. Knowing what you know now, like what would you tell your young self to prepare for as an assistant coach? Because you had good guidance when you first got there, but like what, anything else, like what would you tell your young self? Stay with your family. Stay with your family. Stay with your family. You know, don't, don't, don't try to don't try to go at college basketball on your own. Don't think that you have the answers to how to be successful in college basketball because it's a political game. It's political, and if you are not if you don't have the right stampage, if you're not going to get the stamp by several people, then they will basically stamp you out. <laughs> so you better be with some people that will give you a stamp of approval, because in college basketball, they will they they all talk. It's a small fraternity, man, and you know, if they don't, if they ain't feeling you, if they have a certain uh, uh, belief about you, it is, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to change that. So I would say stay with your family. If I, if I could go and do it all over again, I would say just stick with your family. Stick with your family and, and, and see how it plays out from there.
Awesome, man. Well, I love it. Look, man, thank you again, Chris, for being a guest on the show and being our mask. Is there anything you want to leave the people with before you? Because you dropped some great knowledge today. But anything yeah. else you want to leave people with before we go? Yeah, well, since we talk about since young assistant coaches, one, one of the things I think the young assistant coaches need to realize is that the head coach is going to always land on his feet. He's going to land on his feet. So as a sister coach, you've got to put yourself in position to be able to land on your feet. you got to invest your money. You have to invest your money. you got to take care of your money. you got to save your money. You know, if you're moving every three years, you're going to look up and you're going to be 50 years old. You have nothing to show for it. The head coach ain't going down that road. So you got to put yourself in position to invest your money in many, many, many avenues so that when it's all said and done, you have something to fall back on. Awesome, man. That's awesome to leave with. And I want to thank you viewers for watching another great show. Stay tuned for the next guests as we get them unmasked. See you next time and stay safe.